Today, I'm going a little bit raw and telling you about my experiment with prolonged intermittent fasting and how I quickly reversed some really annoying eczema and what the underlying root cause was. So stay tuned to hear my kind of open-ended thoughts about this experiment and what came of it. Welcome to the Less Stressed Life podcast. This is your host, Krista Bigler, private practice integrative nutritionist, helping people across the U.S. reverse digestive issues, eczema, and autoimmunity via phone and video consult. To learn more, visit lessstressednutrition.com. Now, on to the show. Hey, it's Krista, and today I'm going to tell you about my experience with some prolonged intermittent fasting, and then also tell you about something that happened recently with some eczema popping up and how I eliminated it quickly, kind of using this weird hybrid method. Uh, I sort of hesitated sharing this because it's a little kind of raw, and I didn't know if it was very appropriate for kind of kind of a public conversation. However, based on the people that messaged me. Uh, that listen to the podcast, I know that the people that listen to this podcast are intelligent people. So I thought you might want to know about this. So first off, let's talk about what intermittent fasting is kind of briefly. This certainly doesn't need to be the all-inclusive research-based thing on intermittent fasting. I'm going to give you the quick and dirty. So intermittent fasting is sounds awful because who doesn't want to eat? That's kind of what I always would say as well. But I call it kind of gut rest um, sometimes. And so intermittent fasting, you can. there's a couple ways to do it. You can do alternate. There's actually many ways to do it. You can do alternate days. So eat one day, don't eat the next day, eat one day, don't eat the next day. And I want to make sure I go over contraindications and people who shouldn't do this and people who maybe should, etc. Um, and then there's another more popular common one, which is essentially like when is the kitchen open, right? Like when do you, how many hours a day do you eat food and how many days do you not eat or how many hours do you not eat food? And so it's really kind of thought that everyone should be able to, um, should be able to fast for 12 hours overnight. Why? Because your body does actually need that rest and digest period to clean and repair. Um, Actually, we do need this migrating motor complex. We actually need that between meals as well. So we do need to give our bodies a break between meals to rest and digest and do the migrating motor complex or the janitor in the gut. So um, intermittent fasting is usually taking that a step farther. Most of the uh, my, the understanding that I have of the research is that some of the best results or uh, benefits around fasting are when you fast for 15 or 16 hours or more. And that means you're going to be eight hours on eating and 16 hours off. So what's that look like? It just means kind of pushing maybe the time that you eat in the morning if you don't eat breakfast to maybe 10 or 12 or something like that. And then closing up that kitchen which is just the analogy here, right? Like stopping eating a little bit earlier. How do you do that? You don't really want to be hungry. So people usually increase healthy fats to do that. Okay. So what are the benefits? Why would people actually do this? So there's a couple things um, that can happen. So some people do it for weight loss actually, because in theory you are reducing calories because you might be, you know, you're eating less probably as a side effect of not eating as long of the day. You're also being a little more conscious. Like if you say, I'm not going to eat after 6 p.m., you're being just a little bit more cognizant. So I don't have a lot to say about that. In general, I'm more interested in these other benefits. So um, when you're intermittent fasting and you're not trying to fuel, like you are going to feel really hungry if you don't load up with a little bit of healthy fat at some point. For me personally, intermittent fasting doesn't mean I don't eat or drink anything. Of course, it sh- you should always be drinking and hydrating all the time. Um, so that should never be a concern. But as far as eating, if I'm going to have, um, like if I'm going to have a beverage or if I'm going to have, I can have a handful of nuts. If it's not spiking my blood sugar. I don't really worry about it. I still, um, generally will call that intermittent fasting. It just kind of depends on how loose you are. What are the goals I'm looking for? So, um, a lot of people, intermittent fasting is a way to put someone into a state of ketosis. And that's when your body uses fat for fuel instead of glucose or carbohydrates for fuel. Um, But I'm actually interested in this other thing that happens when you're in this fasted state, 
it'll increase this fatty acid called butyrate in your gut, the production of that. And that is naturally very gut healing. So I would not say necessarily that fasting on its own is like the end all for gut healing because I really don't believe that at all. Um, but I think it could be a useful piece, especially if that gut does need rest. Maybe it's inflamed, maybe it's whatever, right? So the thing that people do wrong with intermittent fasting is that, um, you don't want to be skipping nutrients. So if you're going to be doing intermittent fasting and you're going to be eating a less large window, you're going to be eating fewer hours. You need to make that food that you're eating count to be awesome. That's what you really should be doing. I always giggle because I think of this guy, (laughs) we were talking about intermittent fasting, you know, late in this program, you know, we'd already accomplished a lot of other things. And he was just kind of doing these up leveling type things, wanted to experiment with some intermittent fasting. And he says, yeah, Krista, I was, you know, I was just intermittent fasting today. I didn't have lunch. And I said, hun, that is not intermittent fasting. That is skipping lunch. Intermittent fasting is one big break where you're not eating and then a, bri- a, a time where you are eating. It's not eat, skip lunch, then eat. Like people don't have any trouble doing that. That's not, that's not beneficial. So it's a little, you know, it's not tricky, but there is some nuances to be very clear about, right? Um, so we'll have someone... I think we'll have uh, someone come on and talk about intermittent fasting in depth. But there's one other key benefit, and this is the benefit that gets talked about with intermittent fasting, is that it can increase autophagy, which is programmed cell death. And that doesn't sound good, but it's basically cleaning up diseased, damaged cells. And because cells divide and replicate, we want to kill, get rid of the diseased and damaged cells so they don't replicate and become cancer and other things, right? And so... It's thought that fasting can therapeutically be used as a preventative measure against cancer and Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. So on that note, there is a researcher in the United States who is very popular and well known for his research around longevity. And he's a gerontologist. His name is Dr. Walter with a V Longo. And he's out of USC um, in California. And he's actually from Italy between two of the blue zones. If you don't know what blue zones are, they're the areas of the world where people live to be over 100. And so he kind of started studying that a little bit, Um, came over here, started studying these single celled organisms, And I don't remember exactly what happened with the research, but it wasn't presenting how you would think. Everyone was kind of making fun of him. And lo and behold, you know, he's kind of got this awesome research center now. So they've kind of been looking at this in cancer research and just making chemotherapy more tolerated. He has a book called The Longevity Diet. And so in that book, he gives a a DIY option to this prolonged fast. And so... But his there's a company that he works with, and they apparently donate the proceeds of these kits that they sell back into their research for for fasting research. Um, but the kits are called Prolon, and it's a prolonged fast, so a five-day fast, but you get to eat. So it's exploiting. The goal of it is to be able to eat food, but still mimic a fast, right? So like that's better than fasting. And quite frankly, I wouldn't really encourage someone to um, fast for a long time without uh, help, uh, for one, uh, coaching, knowing what you're doing, a lot of things in place. So anyway, I am also of the mindset where like, I like convenience. So and I like to experiment. So I'm going to try this, right? I first tried the Prolon, oh, at least a year ago, if not more. So I did the first kit, and I am just kind of going from memory here. And I recall being, like, beforehand pretty inflamed. So remember, the goal is really not about weight loss. Um, for me, it would be about health. And I think in general, I would want people to think pro-health, right? Um, kind of like health nuts would maybe consider doing this. Um, but... So I did the first one and did actually lose a lot of inflammatory water weight, which I had had at that moment, which wasn't a surprise to me. 
but it was a nice little benefit of a of a five day thing where I was eating and a pro what is what does this look like it's like a kit you get and each day has the food in it and it's got everything like perfect the surprising thing is that it tastes good it's really good it's like minestrone soup and tomato soup and it's ready in five minutes and kale crackers and it's a vegan um, based uh, plan and it's just very low calorie and what it's doing is exploiting your body's natural protective ability um, to do that autophagy, right? So you do this and they've got kind of like a a phase in, phase out essentially. So that's what it looks like mechanically, okay? Um, So the first time I did it, I recall kind of being bloated and I and I didn't keep notes at that time so I don't remember perfectly what happened but I know I lost you know about seven pounds um which if you're losing weight at that rate that's going to be somewhat inflammatory water weight in my experience um but I was happy to see it go you know I don't remember what time of year it was or if it was I don't I don't recall um but I remember thinking that it was sort of like shoots and ladders and um, it felt like I got to go up the ladder and shoots and ladders and kind of like jump ahead on some goals and like bloating and some other issues. And so, and I'll kind of bring that back around later, but this time I did the prolon, you know, it's something I had just wanted, honestly, like I just have a bunch of prepaid kits that I got inexpensively. If anyone wants, you know, one email me, um, I only have like a handful left, but please email me. They're under $200. And I think online they're 250. So I had a stock of kits that they sold me low cost in their warehouse. So I thought it was just time for me to use one. So I went ahead and did an experiment on my husband and myself. And so basically, um, I had meant to do this in January, kind of after the holidays. And after that kind of inflammatory period, I kind of review, I kind of view this as maybe like a short anti-inflammatory reset. And I never got around to it until February. So I got it done fairly recently. But here's how it went. I decided this time I would keep a diary and how I felt. I do remember that the first time I did it, the third day, so it's five days, I remember the third day being the hardest. It's actually the lowest amount of food, I think. Um, And I just remember it being challenging. Now, I will tell you that there are some like... (sighs) you can, like, I had a handful of walnuts here and I wasn't spiking my blood sugar. And I chose to like, uh, I remember the first time I chose to have like a quarter of an avocado instead of some of the olives. You can make little substitutions like that. Um, if you want, um, it's, it, it's okay to make some minor adjustments and the company will kind of guide you if you aren't sure. So, Um, I wanted to mention before I go into my experience at the Prolon fasting mimicking diet and my diary from it, um, that this would be contraindicated for teens, pregnant women, and those with a history of disordered eating. Uh, I also think I would be concerned about those who have maybe pretty significant nutrient deficiencies because you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be serving that essentially. And that would be my, one of my biggest concerns is that, um, of course, all those other ones, but the nutrient deficiencies that people might not be aware of. And that's why maybe in practice, I wouldn't do this in the way that I did it as often, um, unless it was a good fit for someone. So that's that. So the first day, easy peasy. Um, I wrote, always surprised at how good the food tastes for having near zero prep time. Just got back from a long weekend where I was eating plenty of inflammatory food. So it was time for the anti-inflammatory reset. That's it. Day two, I was a little more emotional. It was a long day of work and it was my child's birthday. And so we had a, we were having more people over for dinner, which meant prepping food I'm not eating, which is not fun since I'm obsessed with food and eat a fair amount of chocolate. I find myself feeling a little bit like a voracious bear in the kitchen and wanting more food while I prep. I'm texting my other dietitian friend who's done this before and she's mindset coaching me. Uh, Mindfully in general, it's really eye-opening to be aware of all the extra stuff that we want to eat between meals or how opening that pantry triggers feelings of grabbing from my chocolate stash. So I have a little tiny piece of monk fruit sweetened chocolate on day two and then another piece and this doesn't really feel like it should sabotage but cocoa can provoke and irritate 
bacterial overgrowth. And I'm dealing with some right now for a variety of reasons. I just checked it with a stool test because I wanted to deal with it before it got too bad. And it's progressively gotten worse since the holidays. And the last couple acutely stressful months of work, lots to be said about this, which I'll mention later. Um, Anyway, the chocolate caused gas in 30 minutes, which is annoying. This is actually a slap in the face because I needed... um, I knew how significant it is for me to deal with the bacterial imbalance I've been ignoring. So I realized that if I'd just eaten at five when I was hungry, I probably could have curved all these feelings. I ended up drinking uh, a turmeric beverage that's stevia sweetened. I mentioned this because it was like an easy in place of my packet of olives. Um, And so after my dinner soup, I was totally satisfied and full. I also thought it would be a great idea to share a cupcake with my husband for my child's birthday, but my husband was surprisingly the one that was firm on not wanting anything else. Remember, he's doing this experiment with me. I also found myself easily distracted in the evening, and I couldn't focus as well as I wanted to. I realized that I skipped the glycerol drink that comes with the kit, which isn't really appropriate because it helps with not um, wasting muscle and kind of with kind of with like how you utilize the energy. I did add some other supplements like colostrum and bees on this day because I was kind of trying to play with, I had a slight headache early in the day, which could have been one moving into into ketosis and lack of water, which is most probable and two releasing inflammation and just needing more water and electrolytes. So day two, this time around was the toughest for me. Day three 5.30 a.m. Can I get up yet? I have so much energy. This is really a typical response for me going on an anti-inflammatory protocol. Fatigue can be manifested by one, inflammation, like it is for me, two, nutrient depletion, which this would not help with, three, gut imbalances that zap nutrients that lead to fatigue, a possible root cause for reason number two. And the last time I did this, I felt like day three was the hardest. It's going to be a long day of work. So I wonder if hydrating hard and telling myself it would be a good day will just change that. Day four and day five were a breeze. I was so focused on my work, didn't have any trouble and had zero hunger. I was definitely in ketosis and kind of in that Zen state. And truly, I chose on the night of day five to make a nice dinner just out of decision of like, I want to make a nice dinner for my family. I feel great and I want to do this and I want to chew food, Uh, you know, and I just chose to end my fast at that time, even though I should have ended it on Saturday morning, you know, to do the whole thing completely. But I felt like I had done enough because I hadn't even taken advantage of what was in my boxes on day five. So that was kind of my personal experience. I bounced out of that. This isn't the first time I fasted. So I'm already a little bit more, quote unquote, medically, uh, metabolically flexible, because once you've done things once, it seems like it's easier and easier. I will say that when I added this to my life, it did seem to improve my overall blood sugar balance and how I could handle things and not being hangry, etc. So that's kind of the experience with Prolon this time. I will mention that I suppose you're wondering, did you lose any weight? I really didn't lose too much weight. I I lost three pounds um, in those five days. And that was fine. And what did that tell me that maybe I didn't have so much inflammatory water weight to lose that time. And that's okay. What I will say is that sometimes the number on the scale isn't really reflective of what you're feeling. What I hadn't completely grasped fully until after this experience was that I was dealing with some bloat, and this is where this story kind of segues, and this is not just a review of this prolon. It's kind of my hybrid. So let's rewind a couple weeks before I did the prolon fasting mimicking diet, and I'll tell you what was going on in life. So it's winter, and I have some genetic predisposition to not really have like great omegas and great vitamin D, and so the winter for me leads to kind of, it can be a drier time for my skin, as it is for many people's skin. And so um, it that was a concern, right? And I'd thrown some things at it, and it seemed to improve. But recently, it was getting not good. Like, to the point where I don't like things, right? So it was kind of getting rashy. And I would say that um, a couple weeks before I did this, I was starting to get some 
like spots of a rash around my neck. Well, if you know much about my story, it's a lot about overcoming eczema and gut health issues. Well, I know better. I mean, I do this (laughs) in life. And what I want you to take away from this is not that I'm, my point is, is that, yeah, you can relapse, but I want you to know why that this could have happened. And I talked about this in my day two diary, but this was after the holidays. It was after two to three stressful months of work and stress physiologically will drive down stomach acid, which will make you more open to um, bacterial overgrowth and other things. And so basically, uh, I was kind of like setting myself up for this. It's also possible that I wasn't like in perfect bacteria symphony previously. Like, let's pretend I don't do things always the way they're supposed to be done. And I'm always like trying to press, you know, push the limit. And so maybe I didn't completely finish past protocols. Yes, that would be true. Uh, So I know that that's true. I know it was a very stressful time and I know it was post like junk food holidays, whatever. And there's no concern about that. But it was like, I think those things led to being kind of a perfect storm where I had some bacterial imbalances that seemed to be causing some rashes. Now, I didn't know for sure that that was the cause. However, I chose to be very proactive. And again, I do this in my work on a regular basis. So I looked at the, I looked at a gut test, right? The best one, the one I use. And I saw, you know, it was fairly... Uh, minor dysbiosis, but still significant, meaning I didn't have the worst I'd seen, but it needed to be addressed. So how did I utilize this information? I got this information back right before I started the Prolon fasting mimicking diet. And so I decided to pair that with some, uh, a new kind of experimental protocol. I was, I was just experimenting really with some different herbs that I knew would work for bacteria and some that work for fungus. And that was especially a product that I was experimenting with. And so I utilized those products on top of doing the prolon fasting mimicking diet. And it allowed me because what I was doing with gut rest was starving that bad bacteria in my gut already. I was able to go in there and kind of quickly work on killing them. Now I'm working toward actually finishing my own self-prescribed protocol as needed to finish the job, make sure everything is shored up and looks really good. But guess what happened? So the most success I saw that I was happy about at the end of my Prolon fasting mimicking diet, which I'm not crediting Prolon specifically only for, it was kind of a combination of things, right? And also managing stress and doing some good things at that time too. But in that week, I was able to clear up these rashes, which was fantastic because it could have taken a little bit more tinkering had I not done that. So um, I mentioned, yeah, uh, the rash popped up. I wanted to say the stress, the holidays, a couple other factors that could impact it. Genetically, I have a predisposition to gut issues. So I have this gene gene issue or a genetic variant, FUT2, that just doesn't operate at full speed. Basically, it operates at 30% instead of 60 or 100%. And so it operates slowly. And so that makes me more open to having some gut issues, right? And so I see that a lot in practice when I look at genetics of people. And that's probably part of the reason I'm seeing them. And then the other thing is, it's good to keep in mind what's going on in your family. So if you have a spouse or someone else with symptoms, then we have to keep thinking about them. My husband had symptoms that he was not working on in the way that we would want him to. And I've since kind of like, you know, cracked the whip and said, hey, you're going to take care of this completely because I don't want you sharing that bacteria with me, right? So that's my little story about my experience with the Prolon Fasting Mimicking Diet and how I quickly found and eradicated a rash that I had brewing on myself in the last few weeks. And I hope that was kind of interesting to you a little bit. In the future on the podcast, the next couple podcast episodes I record solo will be about stool testing and the different calibers of it and the different qualities and what you can learn from it and why it's really being underutilized, especially when dysbiosis is such a rampant, rampant problem and digestive issues are kind of through the roof. So I want to shed some light on that because I think it's kind of a public service to do so. Make sure you subscribe to follow along and not miss that. If you found this episode helpful, but you'd actually like more information about intermittent fasting, we have a blog roundup, a three post series that we'll put in the show notes. You can find that there. 
And if you have any questions, please go to lessstresslife.com. It'll take you over to my website, which on the main page, you can actually record a voice message, a question via this little app called SpeakPipe we've put on the website. And I'd love to start answering some of your questions or having some of your comments in the show or on the air because you guys are awesome. Can't wait to talk to you again next week. Love and God bless. Talk to you soon. One of the best gifts you could give us at The Less Stress Life is your feedback. We are paid in podcast reviews. If you enjoyed this or any other episode, please leave us a review. In the iTunes store or from your podcast app, just search for Less Stress Life as if you're not already subscribed. Click on the banana face image, scroll to the bottom where it shows the text of other reviews, and write a review. While you're there, hey, make sure you hit subscribe. For Android or Stitcher users, you gotta go to the desktop site and search for Less Stress Life, and then scroll down to leave a review. Stitcher doesn't load Apple reviews on their site, so if you want, you can leave a review in both places. Your feedback means a lot to the success of the show. Thanks so much for taking the time to do that. You rock.